Well, if you have a Bible, turn with me to Psalm 103, Psalm 103. This is actually my favorite Psalm out of all of them. And so I'm so excited that we get to spend some time in this passage. Uh, As we go through this today, it's going to be really helpful for you if you actually have your Bible open, because we're basically going to walk through almost every verse in this Psalm and talk about it. And it's going to help, especially if you have a print Bible in front of you to do that. Uh, I'd also encourage you anytime throughout this series, remember that the Psalms We're not just written so we get all the information out of them. These are actually prayers that God wants us to pray to him. So each week after we talk about a psalm in the service, it would be amazing if you spent some time that week making this psalm your prayer, praying through that. So let me read to you Psalm 103. It says, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And his righteousness with their children's children. With those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Let's thank God for speaking to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The the theme of this psalm is God's compassion. Here's a really simple definition of, of compassion. Compassion is when you see something that's hard for someone else and you care enough to do something about it. When you see what's hard for someone else and you care enough to do something about it. Both in the Greek and the Hebrew, the original languages of the Bible, the word for compassion is related to the word for intestines, believe it or not. Because this is what compassion is. It's when you look on a situation, you look at someone's problem and you say, oh, you feel that feeling that says, I want to do something about that. I'm going to make your problem my problem. And when you realize it that way, it's astounding that God would actually treat us with compassion. But that's actually what the psalm says over and over again. We're actually going to look at three ways that God expresses his compassion to us. Here's the first one. God has compassion for our needs. We see God's compassion for our needs. Do you ever talk to yourself? No, I don't think that I talk to myself. Are are you sure you don't talk to yourself? No, that would be super weird, especially if I did it in public. I'm pretty sure I don't talk to myself. Okay, whatever you say. It, It turns out that talking to yourself, learning how to talk to yourself, is actually one of the keys to good mental and spiritual health. Look look at what David's actually doing in this passage. Normally in a worship song, you address God directly. But here in verses one and two, David addresses his own soul. He says, praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He's saying, soul, I've got something to say, and, and you better do what I tell you to do. David is talking to himself. Why does he do that? Why is he talking to his own soul? It's because he isn't feeling it. You ever been there? You ever been called to worship and you're supposed to sing a song of praise in church and maybe even today and you're just not feeling it? Or you sit down to pray and you know you're supposed to, but it's just not coming up and you you feel like, "I, I, I don't feel the motivation to do this. Well, guess what? 
you're not the only one. Apparently you can be King David, one of the most passionate worshipers in history. And sometimes you don't feel like worshiping. Sometimes it's hard to want to praise God. It's actually normal. There's this myth out there that for something to be authentic, for it to be genuine, it has to come bubbling up out of you almost spontaneously, automatically. And so because of that, a lot of people, instead of setting aside a regular time to pray and to worship God and to express gratitude, they just say, okay, I'll pray when I feel moved to pray. I'll worship God when I feel moved to worship. What they're doing, it's almost like they're listening to their souls and and listening for their soul to say, hey, I want to pray now. I want to worship now. And then they do it. But you know what happens if we do that? Our lives end up not having a whole lot of prayer or worship in them. If you talk to an artist or an author or a songwriter, all the very best ones will tell you, don't wait for inspiration to strike before you start creating something. The best way to do it is to actually set a schedule and say every single day, I'm going to make something, whether I feel inspired or not. That's actually the way you become good at creating something. You you do it again and again and again. And before long, it's starting to come up more naturally. You're creating more beautiful and artistic things automatically because you did it when you didn't feel like it. I think the same thing is true about praising God. There are lots of times when you don't feel like worshiping, but it doesn't matter. You choose to do it anyway. But how do you get your soul to praise God when you don't feel like it? You do it by talking to yourself. Instead of listening to your soul, you speak to your soul and say, soul, it is time to praise God. And you don't just tell your soul what to do. You actually give your soul reasons to worship God. That's what David is doing in the rest of this psalm. He is looking at the reasons that we should praise God. And he starts by pointing out God's compassion for our needs. Look at what he says in verse two. He says, Forget not all his benefits. Do not forget. This is the key. Remembering the ways God has shown you compassion in your times of need. He starts listing them in verse three. Maybe you've experienced some of these things. He says, he forgives all your sins. What what have you been forgiven from? What, What has God changed in your life? There are a lot of you who have a story about the person you used to be. And you are no longer that person. God brought you out of that life, changed you, forgave you. Do you remember what God has forgiven you for. It says he heals all your diseases. He heals all your diseases. Have you experienced healing? So many of us have, uh, either by miracle or by medicine, we have experienced healing, maybe for a physical injury or an illness, maybe a mental health struggle or an addiction or grief or some deep wound in our past. We've experienced healing. Do you remember that? He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Do do you remember a time when you were in the pit, when things had fallen apart in your life? Maybe it was in your family or in your work or your finances and you wondered, how am I ever gonna get out of this? And now you can look back and say, God pulled me out of that. He redeemed it. He made beauty out of something that was tragic at the time. Do you remember? Do you remember? He satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Do you know the moments when God has brought satisfaction into your life? Those moments of joy. Maybe you can think of the big ones. A wedding, adopting a child, getting a promotion. Or maybe it's just the ordinary everyday things. When you say, I just had a moment of satisfaction when I I just grilled the perfect burger. Or there was a, a surprise rainbow to see. Or I got to FaceTime with my granddaughter. Those little moments, do you, do you notice them? Do you remember them? The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. But where has God worked justice in your life? Maybe you are in an abusive relationship. Maybe you were accused of something at work that you didn't do. Maybe you were profiled because of your race or your gender. And God worked righteousness. He worked out the right outcome in that situation. Do you remember where God has done that for you? Because it's so easy to forget. In the Bible, in those times, in order to remember the things God had done, they would often build a monument. They would put a big stone or they would pile a bunch of rocks together. They would do something durable because they knew that their own memories were, were, were faulty and they needed something that would stick around. They could see again and again and say, in this spot, God showed me compassion. But what do you need to do to remember God's compassion in your life? 
Maybe this week you need to sit down and journal for a while. Maybe look back on the past year and say, this is what God has done. This is where God was present. Maybe each day you need to have each person in your home say one thing they were thankful for, maybe at dinner time or at bedtime, something from that day, they say, God gave me a little bit of joy right there. Or maybe you need to make something or, or find something to be a symbol of something God has done. And you put it in a place where you're going to see it again and again and say, God showed me compassion. God showed me compassion. Now, as I've been reading this passage, some of you may be asking the question, but what do I do when I don't see those benefits? I can't think of those things that God has done. I mean, it says heal all your diseases. Come on. I mean, why am I still sick? Where's my healing? And what about the pandemic? For goodness sake. He satisfies your desires with good things. Okay, Mick Jagger, where's my satisfaction? Why was my basement flooded this week? Why can't I go hug my mom? Why did I have to miss out on the end of my senior year, my my sports and my prom and my graduation? Why am I on unemployment right now? He works justice for all the oppressed. You really want to go there. You want, what do you want to start talking about? Human trafficking, racism, hunger, The the fact that in Kane County, one in five people is food insecure. Where's the justice? I wonder if any of you have been on our website to go to our prayer wall. It's been really cool over the last few weeks. So many people have been posting requests up there, sharing the things that they need prayer for. And when they do that, 10, 30, 80 people will pray for that prayer request. It's amazing. But as I've been doing this and I've been praying for people's requests, I've been thinking about people who are going through a divorce or they, they've got cancer or financial needs or, or depression and anxiety and all sorts of things that I think, I wonder how they pray this prayer in their situation. I wonder if it's difficult for them. How do you pray this Psalm honestly when it's hard to see God's benefits? Let, let me suggest two things that I find helpful in those situations, especially when I'm invited to sing a happy song of praise or a, a pray a Psalm like this one. The first thing to do is to pray this prayer from the future from the future. So has this ever happened to you? You are, it's Christmas morning or your birthday and someone gives you a gift and and they hand it to you. It's beautiful. And uh, you pick it up. You you kind of shake it and wonder what's inside of it. And you think, oh man, I got to look at this. And you pull open the paper and there's a box. And so you you open the box to see what it is. And there's a, a piece of paper inside. And the note says, I got you a gift. I, I bought you an iPad but it hasn't arrived yet. I love you. Merry Christmas. What what do you do in that moment? It's Christmas morning and you don't have a gift. Nothing to to start playing with, nothing to show off, nothing to hold in your hand. You've got nothing there. What, What do you say? What do you do? What you do is you look the person who gave you that box in the eye and you say, wow, Thank you so much. This was such a generous and thoughtful gift. I am so excited about this. Why do you do that? Because you know it's guaranteed. It's on its way. You you thank them for something that has not arrived because you know it has already been paid for. So it's as good as yours. This is what is true about all these things in this Psalm. Complete healing, total satisfaction, perfect justice, Those things have already been purchased and paid for by Jesus on the cross. They are guaranteed and they are coming in his kingdom, even if you don't see them all the time right now. And there are times when we need to thank God for things from the perspective of a future that is assured, but hasn't arrived. The other thing I do with praying these sorts of prayers is sometimes I actually shift the posture of the prayer. It's actually okay to do this. There are times when you read a psalm and you say, God, this is a a psalm of gratitude and joy and I I want to be thankful, but I'm having a really hard time with that. You're just honest with God. You say, God, I I wanna thank you, but I feel like I really need to lament. Where where are these things in my life? Why why aren't they there? How long, God, until I have these things? And, And it's okay. It's actually good to have that mixture of thankfulness and lament. They can actually exist side by side. It's actually a healthy thing to do to learn how to incorporate both of those into your spiritual life. Now, I would elaborate more on this, but I actually did a teaching on this that we posted this Wednesday on social media. So if you want to know more about how to do that, uh, you can go and check out that teaching. I'd recommend it. But this is what we do. This, we, we look at where God has shown us compassion, even if it's compassion promised in the future, and we remind ourselves of the benefits of God's compassion. But David goes deeper. 
He goes beyond the needs that we can see and feel to the deeper needs that we often ignore. In the next section of the psalm, we see God's compassion for sinners. Look at verse 7. It says this, He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. Why does David mention Moses here? Moses was the first leader of the people of Israel about 500 years before David was king. And he's referring to a story in the life of Moses after Moses has led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. He takes them to Mount Sinai where God makes a covenant with his people. And so Moses goes up on the mountain to talk with God about what this relationship is going to look like between him and his people. And at one point over the course of the conversation, Moses says to God, he says, God, I want to know you. I want to see you. I want to know what you're like. So show me your glory. God says to Moses, I can't do that for you. If I did that, it would be like walking on the surface of the sun. You would die. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass by you and I'm going to let you see sort of the afterglow of my presence. And as I pass by, I'm going to speak my name and reveal to you what I'm really like. And so God takes Moses and puts him in in a crack in the mountain and God passes by. And as he passes by, he speaks his name and he says, I'm the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. This is the description of God that David incorporates into his psalm in verse eight. It, It turns out that this is the most frequent description of God in the entire Old Testament. I don't know what comes to your mind when someone says Old Testament God, but usually it is not compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Most people think that somewhere between the Old and New Testament, God found a therapist and worked out his issues. But if you were actually in the Old Testament and you asked an Israelite, tell me about the God that you worship, this is probably what they would have said. They they would have said, he's slow to anger, slow to anger. He is not like us. We, we get angry like that and, and not for good reasons either. Someone inconvenienced us or bruised our ego. But God, even when he has a good reason to be angry, he is still slow to anger. There, there are a lot of skeptics who like to say, you know, the God of the Old Testament is always angry. But if you actually read the Old Testament and you see what people in the Old Testament complain to God about, usually it's not that he's too angry. It's that he's waiting too long to do something. They, they say, how long, O oh Lord, will you let the wicked prosper? They're calling for him to rise up and, and defend justice. God is slow to anger and abounding in love. I don't know about you, but I would love to be abounding in love. My love runs out so quickly. It is hard to keep caring sometimes, but that is never, ever a problem for God. His love keeps going and going and going, and there's still more. That's how an ancient Israelite would have described the God they worshiped. Of course, they also would have said that God was just. The the rest of the description that God gave Moses includes this. It says, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He says that not because he's not loving, but actually precisely because he is loving. He insists on justice because sin and evil and injustice destroys the world and the people that he loves. So if he let the guilty go unpunished, he would be like a judge who just let criminals walk away free or a father who refused to defend his children. Of course, the problem is when you find out that your children are also the criminals. And this is the thing that we have to face. See, you and I, we're part of the problem. When you ask the question, what is wrong with the world? Part of the answer has to be me. My anger destroys peace. My lust objectifies people. My gossip erodes trust. My greed leads to exploitation and poisons creation. My deception defames people who are made in the image of God. I am part of the problem. I do these things every day and they contribute to the brokenness of the world. I am one of the guilty and God has every right to punish me. But look at what it says in verse 9. Even when God has good reason to be angry, it says he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. That's amazing. But but how does that work? How, How can God be just and still 
He does not treat us as our sins deserve. This is where the compassion of God comes in. Remember, compassion is when you say, I'm going to make your problem my problem. And God amazingly does that even when we are our own problem. When we have made the problem ourselves, God looks at us and says, I'm going to do something about that. And so Jesus Christ is God's compassion in the flesh. He looks at us and he says, they are guilty. They are condemned. They ought to be judged. They deserve to be punished. But I am going to become one of them. I'm going to become their representative. I'm going to take on their problem as my problem. And I am going to pay the price that they owe. That's God's compassion. By taking our punishment on the cross, Jesus finds a way to punish our sin without treating us as our sins deserve. It's amazing. And here's the result of that. Look at verse 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. When you were a kid, you ever stare up into the sky, wonder what was up there? Maybe jump up and try to touch a cloud or grab a star. Wonder what it was made out of that made it so blue. In the ancient world, when people looked up, they they thought they saw a a dome that was kind of hanging over the world. You know, it was blue and it was filled with stars and it moved. And they they looked at that and without a telescope, that's a, a fairly reasonable way to describe it. And they figured that dome is so far away. No one could ever reach it. It's impossible to get up there. It's so, so far away. And so David uses this image to express the massiveness of God's love. It's as far away as that. I think David would have still used the image today, especially if he knew what we know about the sky. If he knew that you could, if you could travel at the speed of light, you could circle the planet in seven and a half times in one second, but at the same speed, it would still take you four years to get to the closest star. It would take you 16,000 years to get to the furthest star that we can see with the naked eye. It would take you 13 billion years to get to the farthest object we can detect. The heavens go on forever and God's love goes even farther. But as big as that love is, it is really difficult for many of us to experience it. And the problem is that we carry around so much guilt and so much shame. That we do a lot of things to distract ourselves from our shame, our our sense of failure, but it's always kind of right there. Try as you might, you cannot shake it. So what do you do about that? Well, on your own, there actually is nothing, nothing that you can do. But, But look at what God does. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. So imagine two people standing right here, back to back, one facing east, one facing west. And and I say, all right, you need to start walking and do not stop walking until you have finally reached the east and the west. Okay, go. When would they stop walking? Never. You could always go further east or further west. Now, some of you right now, I'll just pause. I know some of you are overthinking this, very analytical types. You're like, okay, but the world is round. And what about the oceans? Are they allowed to stop for bathroom breaks? Okay, don't do that. Feel the feeling of that image more and more distance between you and your sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far God has taken your transgressions from you. Your guilt, your shame, your sin, they are nowhere near you at all. And that means you don't have to carry that shame around anymore. You are free to not be defined by your failures and your regrets. You have permission to let go of that weight. If you have surrendered to Christ, he has taken it away. But if you haven't surrendered to Christ, here's the question I have for you. What are you waiting for? Why would you want to keep carrying around that guilt and that shame? You can lay it down. Surrender to the God of compassion, the one who takes away your sin. He has compassion on sinners. In the final section of this psalm, we also see God's compassion for mortals. His compassion for mortals. So uh, a a little bit over a month ago, I was talking with my father-in-law and he said something kind of unexpected. It was still earlier on in the pandemic and the kind of steady, you know, number after number of how many cases and how many deaths, it it hadn't really become the background of our lives. And so everybody was fixated on these numbers. And we were talking about that, the effect that it had on us and the effect we could see that it was having on other people. 
And we realize, you know, this is probably not a, a really good thing for people's anxiety to constantly be watching that tick up and up and up. But as we were talking about that, he said, you know, but on the other hand, there's actually something refreshing about the fact that we're talking about how many people died. I was like, wait, <laughs> what are you talking about? And some of you are probably thinking your father-in-law is a warped individual. And he might be, okay? I know that you're watching, all right? But what do you hear why he said that? He said that the thing is that there have always been people dying. It's always been happening. We could fill the newspaper with, with the statistics of how many people die of car crashes and cancer and hunger every single day. But we don't like to think about that. We like to pretend that people aren't dying all the time every single day. And we like to pretend like it's not going to happen to us. But at the very least, this is making us aware of reality and we're talking about it. What do you think about that? Do you think it's a good thing for us to think about our death? If you ask that question to a Christ follower a hundred years ago or further back, they would have all said, yes, it is very important to think about your death. Every pastor would have talked about this in sermons. It was kind of standard advice along with pray every day and be generous with the poor and love your neighbor. Remember you will die. Over the last hundred years or so though, our culture has shifted and made it so that death is almost a taboo subject. We, we don't see a lot of death in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, part of that's because we don't have livestock to see animals die. Uh, thank goodness, thank God that uh, infant mortality has plummeted. And, and people who are old and sick, usually when they die, it's in a nursing home or a hospital, not in the place where other people live. And so while we see a lot of murder on TV, we don't usually see a lot of real life death. And so because of that, we don't talk about it, even with people who are close to us. And we usually avoid thinking about our own death. But for the first 1900 years of the Christian faith, it was very normal in sermons for pastors to say, make sure you take a moment every day to remember that you will die. Why would they say this? Because they knew that it was true and they knew that only by facing the fact of our death could we experience God's compassion in our mortality. Look at verse 13. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. During shelter in place, Michelle and I have been working around our yard. We've taken out a fence and we've laid down some sod and we uh, planted a vegetable garden and we took out some flowers we didn't like anymore. And so we've made a bunch of changes. And I, I noticed something interesting that maybe just a week after we made those changes, I couldn't really remember what the yard used to look like. And I don't mean that I couldn't, you know, call it to mind kind of how things were before. It's just, I got acclimated to the new look. I would walk by a window and instead of saying, oh, that's different, I, I just sort of, you know, that's the way it looks. And I'm pretty sure that after a year or so of it looking different, I probably won't even be able to recall exactly how it looked before that. You ever had that experience? Maybe you've lived in a place long enough that you, you've run across a picture of your home, uh, you know, a couple years back and you're like, oh, I completely forgot about that. I just had this experience. We used to have an apple tree in our front yard and we cut it down maybe just a year ago. And I saw a picture and I was like, oh, I completely forgot about the tree. This is the way it works. The flowers of the field and the trees of our yard are here today and forgotten tomorrow. And we'd like to think that that's not going to be the case for us as people. But let me ask you a question. Can you name all four of your grandparents and what they did for a living? Well, hopefully most of you can. But can you name all eight of your great grandparents and what they did for a living? Just, just those two facts, their name and their career. Can you name all 16 of your great-great-grandparents? Can you even name one of your great-great-grandparents and what they did for a living? Here's the truth. Except for the very youngest of us today, in 75 years or so, just a handful of people are going to remember what you did with your life. In 100 years, there will be a few people who remember your name. In 150 years, basically all of us will be forgotten. Think of it this way. How many U.S. presidents can you name? 
Okay, there have been 45 presidents over the last 250 years. They held enormous power over our country and influence in our world. They have shaped the lives of millions and billions of people in profound ways. How many U.S. presidents can you name? Turns out the average American can name eight presidents. Now, I'm pretty sure that the people of our church are much better at history than the average American, but still, these are presidents that even the ones that you can name, if I asked you, could you describe what they did during their time in office? Could you actually do it? I mean, think about that. Think about that. You could be the president of the United States and in a hundred years, your name would still be in a book, but the average person to them, you're Millard Fillmore. Millard Fillmore, who is that guy? All of us die and all of us are forgotten. Now at first, that, that sounds like really bad news. And if nothing's done about it, it is pretty bleak. But look at verse 17. Verse 17 says this. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. We we are here today and gone tomorrow. But for those who fear God, who bow their knee and surrender to him, God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. That, That means that long before God made the world, Before you even existed, he knew you and he loved you. And long after you were gone, when your place remembers you no more, he will still know you and love you. When everyone else in the world has forgotten you, the most important person in all of existence will still remember who you are. He will know you and love you. So many people try to deal with the fact of their mortality by ignoring it, putting it out of sight and out of mind. Other people, they will try to use their life to do something significant enough to justify their existence, to push back on their mortality. There there are a whole lot of driven people who are are driven to achieve in sports or academics or building a business or becoming a life-saving doctor or solving world poverty because they don't want to feel like they're just another insignificant blip on the radar. If you do more, if you be more, if you accomplish more, if you're lucky, you get 90 years to prove your worth. And then there's the rest of us who just feel a little bit ashamed. Like we haven't done more with our lives. You know, this is just all we are. But here's the good news. That doesn't matter. No accomplishment can make your life eternally significant. Only the everlasting love of God can do that. What makes your life significant is that God himself had compassion on you. So much that he stepped out of eternity and into mortality. Jesus Christ took on our flesh and blood And he died our death so that we didn't have to die it. And he offers us eternal life because he rose from the dead. It is only when we surrender to the one who loved us with that compassion that our lives become eternally significant. What's amazing is when we recognize this, the fact of our mortality actually becomes a really liberating idea. Because here's what this means. It means you don't have to be God. You don't have to be God. God is not expecting you to be the omnipotent, omniscient, all-knowing, omnicompetent master of your world. You don't have to feel guilty for being a flower of the field. When you hit that milestone birthday and you look back and you realize, oh man, I'm not as far along as I wanted to be. And you look ahead and you say, I don't have enough time to do all the things that I hoped that I would do. Remember this, the Lord's love is from everlasting to everlasting. When you're handing off something that you built to the next generation and you wonder if what you did is going to last or or if anybody's going to care or even know what you did, remember that the Lord's love is from everlasting to everlasting. In light of the love of God, you have permission, permission to be a limited small human in a body bound to one time and one place. You can live an ordinary quiet life and it's completely okay. You don't have to make something impressive of your life to be eternally significant. You only have to be loved by the God who made you. And here's the surprising twist on that. When you actually realize this, you know what it does? It it makes you more likely to actually make a difference in the world. Because you don't spend so much time and energy on, you know, trying to prove yourself or show that you're worthy. You just give yourself away in sacrificial love and service to other people. And ironically, that is the way that we make a difference in the world. The the compassion of God frees us from the fear of death. Let me read how the psalm ends here. Verse 19. 
The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. It's an incredible vision of God, high and lifted up as the king ruling over all. Not just over all people, but over the the angels and the hosts of heaven and all of creation. Have you ever thought about that? That right now, even as we worship in our living rooms, we are joining in to the eternal heavenly worship that's always going on around God's throne. Can you imagine that? It's amazing. And I love how the psalm ends with the same line that it begins with. Praise the Lord, O my soul. It turns out that this is what your soul was made for. This is where you find satisfaction in praising the God who showed you compassion. And so here's the question I have for you. Will you join in? Will you worship him? For for some of you, you need to take that first step in, in bowing your knee to the one who loved you, surrendering to God's compassion. There, There are some of you who have never actually said to Jesus, I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. I know that I'm going to die and there's nothing I can do to save myself from that. Jesus, I need you to save me. Have you ever done that? If you've never done that, I actually think that this would be a great time to do it. As we pray to just express to God, I need your compassion to rescue and save me and to bow your knee and surrender to him. So let's do that now. Let's pray. God, we come to you as the God of compassion. And we want to surrender ourselves to you with a a simple prayer. Prayer that just says, sorry, thank you, and please. So God, I say sorry. I I am a sinner and I deserve punishment. I I know that what I've done has contributed to the brokenness of the world. And I'm guilty. Please forgive me, God. Maybe take a moment to... Think of specific things that you've done that you need to say sorry to God about. And God, I I say thank you. Thank you that in your compassion, you didn't leave me stuck in my sin and my mortality. You, You looked on me, Jesus, and you took on my sin and you paid the price on the cross to take it away. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you didn't stay dead, but you rose from the grave so that I could have eternal life. Thank you for doing that. I couldn't do it for myself. And God, please, please forgive me. Please take away my sin. Separate it from me as far as the east is from the west. God, please let your everlasting love fall on me so that I have hope after death. God, begin to transform me. Change me by your compassion. Make me a new person. Help me live under your rule and reign. God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.